Well, Calum, here we are, episode 97 of Red Tinted Glasses. We're three away from the big 100. And maybe by the time we reach episode 100, we might have a, a positive performance to speak of. Well, I hope so. I very much hope so, because let me tell you, this one's not going to be so positive. It's not going to be positive, but there's mainly going to be rants aimed at you, Bobby Madden, if you're tuning in. And uh, I know there's one of my friends who is a referee uh, in the SPFL. So if you're tuning in, be prepared for another chuckle, because I know you laughed at my comments on John Beaton. Well, the comments on Bobby Madden are not going to be pretty. No, I can't imagine they will be. And uh, I'll echo them, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. But before, Callum, we get into the, the episode and dissecting the uh, the game itself, what we should mention is to, to those of you that are tuning in that we are going to be doing a raffle in aid of the Aberdeen Community Trust and Aberdeen Necessities. As a wee thank you to those of you that continue to support us in this venture, when we reach episode 100, we want to say thank you and give something back to the local community. Our aim is to, to raise funds, as I said, for the community trust and Aberdeen Necessities, who do an excellent job of um, helping and supporting families who live in poverty in the North East. There's currently 18% of children across Aberdeen and Shire living in, in poverty, and their aim is to provide every child a Christmas Eve box this Christmas. A, a Christmas Eve box will contain pyjamas, socks, activities, stories, hot chocolate, sweets, and even reindeer food, just to spread a bit of extra cheer at this time of year. So, Callum, we've managed to club together two pairs of tickets for the Aberdeen-Dundee game on Boxing Day, a print that um, displays the European Cup winning team of 1983, made by Matthew J. Wood, who did the print behind me of Pataudry. And we've also got a pair of signed boots from Richie Byrne, kindly donated them. And Jack Grimmer's also working on something for us as well, but don't have that as yet so can't disclose that but but big thanks to both Jack and Richie for and Matthew as well for for kindly donating prizes and, and Jamie Howell of the, the ticket office at Aberdeen but just just fantastic to be able to to give something back to the people and we'll, we'll have more information on that on on Monday's live episode. 100 I think it's sort of only right given the support people have shown us it's only right that we then try and use that sort of for good use and especially I think around this time of year very very important and also, I suppose, quite fitting that uh, 100 episodes, we've got a signed pair of boots from Richie Byrne, our first proper interview that we had as well. You know, quite, yeah. quite nice. Yeah, no, definitely. We'll, we'll probably tweet out some, some information on that in the build-up to Monday. As we said, we're going to do a live show, two live shows. So if you are new to the channel or a regular and you've not yet hit that subscribe button, make sure you do so and, and hit that like button as well if you continue to enjoy the content. And for those of you that do listen via Apple Podcasts, Google uh, Spotify, wherever you're tuning in, these live shows will be turned into audio uh, once the, the live show is ended and be put out the next day. So don't worry if you, if you don't tune in uh, via um, the video platforms, then you still won't be missing out on that, that content. So hit that subscribe button on YouTube and make sure you follow us on Twitter at RTG underscore podcast for, for all the latest information around that, that upcoming auction raffle and and. Just so you, you don't miss anything, Callum. Who wants to miss us ranting about Aberdeen and Bobby Madden? Oh, it'll be a big one about Bobby Madden. Uh, I don't even want to get started because once I get started, I will get going. It won't be fun. It won't be fun. Well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll start from the very beginning then, as we always do. Stephen Glass's Showtime Reds rolled into Dundee looking to improve on what is a dreadful away record with just one away win domestically all season. Unfortunately, it didn't quite pan out that way. It was more like desperate daytime TV from the Dons as another frustrating 90 minutes endured as we suffered a 1-0 defeat, overshadowed by refereeing decisions and red cars, which we'll come into. But, Calm, as always, we start with the team news. Lewis Ferguson found himself suspended. David Bates caught COVID. And Jack McKenzie found himself coming in. As, as we kind of discussed on this show previously, could he find himself at left centre back? And that's where he did with Dean Campbell continuing at left back and Jack Gurr coming in from the cold to, to slot in at right back to the soft wounds that Ojo move into midfield. 
Yeah, it was an interesting. I don't think we had uh, much of a choice, especially in terms of that, mm-hmm. terms of that defence. Um, interesting, Mackenzie came in. I think perhaps if Bates was fit, probably Mackenzie would not have come in, given the fact he went he went off at half time. Memory a bit hazy after the game, I won't lie. Um, as I <laughs> was sure it, most people's are. Yeah, it was an injury that he picked up. It kind of looked quite innocuous uh, mm. in a tackle right on half time. And it was maybe some some question marks whether he was rushed back too mm. too quickly because it was it looked to be an ankle injury. And I'm not sure which ankle he had actually injured it in in the previous to this, but yeah, not good if he was rushed back too soon, and also mm. not good if it is another serious injury because I did think he looked a bit shaky throughout, maybe not fully confident in the injury itself. Um, but yeah, never good to see see a young player go down, it, and he did look in a, a bit of discomfort. He did. I think it probably is a case of me being rushed back, but basically, I think Mr. Glass's hand was kind of forced with that because mm-hmm. if he didn't come in, then uh, we would have had sort of the, the, the back four that we ended the game with for the whole yeah. game. And oh, it could have been a lot, a lot worse than it was because that was yeah. not pretty either. Yeah, and, and Jack Gurr coming in from the, the cold, um, not seen him, I think, since Wraith, actually. What, what did you make of his performance overall? As you, you said, my memory is probably like yours, quite hazy, but I. Certainly on the on the way back on, on the bus home was having a few arguments with, with people because I thought Jack Gurr in relative terms had a, a decent game. It wasn't obviously he wasn't a standout, but I didn't think he was maybe as dreadful as some people were making out. I agree. I remember yelling at Brun at Tanner about <laughs> <laughs> one of the balls Jack Gurr trying to try to put in. But um I agree. I think he did act, he did actually do okay, especially in the circumstances given the fact he's, you know, he's probably, yeah, he's not played in a couple of months um, mm-hmm. and he's come straight back in in quite a big game uh, away at Tannadice. I don't think, I don't know what else you can really expect from him. Um, sometimes maybe his delivery is not quite on the money, but at the same time, some of the movement from the forwards was totally lacking and that was what I remember yelling at Bruno about. Um, to be honest, the delivery in general from not just him, but everyone was pretty dreadful. I don't remember many times that we beat the first man, certainly mm-hmm. from open play. But yeah, interestingly, on the, the point you, you made about Stephen Glass's hand being forced with the defensive situation, there's a certain player that is currently on loan at a club in Atlanta whose season has just come to an end. A certain Mr. Ronald Hernandez, remember the name? Well, a lot of you do, and his season's just ended. I know his loan is officially with Atlanta until the end of the year, the 31st of December. Interesting, do you think we'll see any movement on that or will that just kind of be swept under the carpet and he'll suddenly be announced as a full-time Atlanta player? Well, the thing is, he's not really been starting that much over there either. I think he's finding himself on the bench recently too. Obviously, he's still probably been involved more than he had been with us. Mm. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if he did become a full-time Atlanta United player, but I kind of just hope he comes back and we actually see him, give him a chance. and Because, um, you know, we're short at the back. Okay, that would probably leave us with Ramsey, Gurr and Hernandez. But given the way things are going, uh, we could do with any defensive option that we could we can get, really. And I'd just like to see Ronnie become a success. Literally through no reason at all. Yeah. Just I just want it to happen. He just seems... Uh, yeah, he's had, a, tr- I think he's had what, a tough time. He's had a tough time. He has, and he played for Venezuela in the international break, grabbing an assist uh, in one of the games. I think it was against Peru. Um, but you know, it might it might leave us with three right backs. But I wonder if he could play left back because you know, if Mackenzie's out for a long time, you're then ju- we're just left with Dean Campbell and Johnny Hayes at, at, at that side. So you know, look, we're not we're not certainly not blessed defensively and. He's still our player, so would it not make almost sense to recall a player instead of going out and spending money on a new one come January? Exactly. I don't, I don't know, just maybe a bit too much common sense for Dave Cormack and co. No, never. I mean, I mean, I see, and I, to be fair, I was thinking that as well. You could, could possibly see him fill in on the left-hand side. Why not? But you mentioned, you know, defensive cover. It's really frustrating looking at that defence that we ended up with that game, knowing that we've still been spending a wage on Michael Devlin as well. I'm just <laughs> going to mention that while we're at it. I mentioned it after the game. It was, uh, it's really, really frustrating that we could have, you know, maybe taken that wage elsewhere and spent it on maybe a left side of centre half. That would have been nice. But, um, you know, here we are. It would be Aberdeen Football Club without some silly decisions. No, it's, it's such funny because I would say in my hazy memory, I do remember a rant about Devlin being 
commented on the bus home but I do also remember someone did reply to us on, on our Twitter account about that defensive situation you know when we revealed that we were going to be missing a defender ahead of the game obviously we didn't want to disclose that it was David Bates that was missing but um, someone says you know well why haven't we you know released Devlin and, and you know freed up a wage that we could have gone and spent on a player that you know hopefully would have been fit I know Kind of, kind of easy to say that they would have been mm. fit, but knowing our luck defensively this season, it's it's not a given anyway. But yeah, that that question mark around his six month deal becomes even more and more pertinent given the the continue continuous problems we have defensively this season. Yeah, it seems mental, especially given the fact it was given a ch- until January to prove his fitness. We're now nearly in December, and we've seen him in training a couple of times. Mm. That's it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So the the game itself, I mean, the first half really didn't, you know, spark into life. It was a half of half chances, if you want to call it that. Uh, Dylan McGee did really well to to block from Jandro Fuchs, uh, which saw the shot go over the bar, and McGee had a free kick easily saved from uh, Benji Segres. And Christian Ramirez probably had the best chance of the half when he flashed a shot wide of the post from kind of didn't really have any right to get a shot away from the edge of the box, but it looked a lot closer from the fair play upper than it than it did when I watched the highlights back this morning. Oh, I know, I know. It's weird to say that that was probably possibly the best chance because although it came the closest, he, you're right, he had absolutely no right in doing that. And we've seen that a couple of times with, you know, a few bicycle, kicking, bicycle kicks and things. Mm. Um, but when you're getting sort of no service, that's the type of thing you have to do, I suppose. Create something of your own. Uh, it's just unfortunate that it didn't go in. That seems to be the case with us all the time. As you've mentioned, a few other chances, you know, girl from distance and things like that. Ah, uh, just very, very frustrating. I think I don't think we did test Benji Segrist nearly enough. Um, no, and I know we're going to come to it, but the only time I really remember him being tested was the the Teddy Jenks chance in the, in the second half. Um, other than that, uh, like I'm, again, it could be down to our hazy memory. Um, I don't really remember having a, him having a decent save to make. But equally, I don't really remember Joel Lewis having a decent save to make as well throughout the whole game. There was one that went onto the post which I think led to the corner, which we conceded yes. from. But other than your that... your memory is, is that good. <laughs> I know, a pretty good day. And, um, but other than that, I don't, I, I can't really recall any. That's having watched the highlights as well, mm. to be fair. Um, but we'll get on to that goal. And, and there's a lot to discuss, I think, there as well. Yeah, I think there's a lot to dissect from there. But there was also a lot to dissect before the half came to a close, Callum. So no time like the present, but we should get into it. First of all, Funza Ojo picks up a yellow card for siding down Callum Butcher. No no complaints, I think, can, can be had on that booking. No, not at all. Um, unlike the second one. But I think, yeah, I think that one... You know, it's a it's type of challenge Butcher himself would have been proud of, to be fair. Yeah, which I found quite ironic given how annoyed he was at the challenge <laughs> um, until the yellow card was shown because I thought, yeah, pot kettle black in that situation. But but Callum Butcher, not to be outdone because he does love a card, found himself sent off after an altercation between Ryan Edwards and Christian Ramirez. Now, if you, you talk about us having hazy memories for the state that that the aforementioned Brune was in, I'm so surprised he managed to see this straight away because I was so caught up in Ryan uh, Ryan Edwards and Christian Ramirez going head to head that when he, sh- to my left, shouts, he's punched him, he's punched him. I'm like, well, they were just standing next to each other. What are you talking yeah. about? But obviously Callum Butcher decides to give Christian Ramirez a wee flick in the, the nether region, shall we call them, and mm-hmm. Christian Ramirez... I think he's he does make the most of it in oh, all yeah. honesty. I, but sorry, carry on. But just a, a stupid act because Bobby Madden's already walking in the direction to to defuse the situation before Callum Butcher takes the law into his own hands. It wasn't even like Butcher was the one involved in it, I know, <laughs> which just makes no sense at all. We seen to a Dundee United fan and um, in the pub before the game and he was saying like he's not he's not played much this season why is but he's coming into this big game and that's a guaranteed card well oh boy was it it was just seemed totally bizarre I not to get anything away from Brew but I remember seeing it and it's having explained to a few people around us as well I think most people were in a similar condition to be fair um, <laughs> but I remember seeing Ramirez at the time it did look very theatrical and I was like yeah. I don't even know if he has actually hit him there but I realised mm. that Ramirez did indeed grab it straight away and I think I recognised his face sort of going 
immediately uh, as it happened. Um, I hope someone screenshots your reaction. Oh, there. I hope not. I really hope not. Don't get my ideas. They don't need them. Um, but you know, yeah, it was just it was a moment of madness, which didn't really, you know, they did madness did not go away um, towards the end of the second half. It didn't, and, and, and that's why I thought, you know, at the time, oh, was he was he did Ryan Edwards like stamp on him or something? Mm. But it, it just kind of came all about uh, of nothing, really. Mm-hmm. You know, just almost kind of was like a pissing contest between Edwards and Ramirez on who was going to blink first, and Callum Butcher tried to defuse it himself. And that that decision, right? Credit where it's due. We'll, we'll we'll applaud Bobby Madden for at least getting that decision right. Mm-hmm. That, that was a red card. And yes, I'm, I am annoyed that I did not back Callum Butcher to be carded because it seems to be such an obvious decision in, in every game. But Funza Ojo, as we've discussed already on a, a warranted yellow card, finds himself hurtling towards the United end, having to hurdle the advertising boards, dodge a ball boy, and before he can even brace for impact, finds himself shoved or assaulted, if you want to use the... the police term um, back from the United end by a 35 year old fan I think that's the big takeaway from that that he's 35 and still wears football tops to a game but oh God. I mean just what a mental incident Callum it was very a very chaotic sort of three minutes or so um, it's interesting yeah the fight she's 35 that is probably the funniest part as soon as I saw that I was like Jesus Christ get a grip of yourself and um, I don't really know I, the fact he's been branded is bad as assault. I mean, I guess fair enough, but it's also a push. Like it's not, it's not that much. But at the same time, you can't go and do that, you know, to foot to football players. Um, poor Foon. So I think to be fair, in the replay, it shows he grabs onto the sort of fence. So I think if he hadn't grabbed onto it, he probably would have fallen over as well, which made it even worse. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I suppose. I almost wish he had fallen over and not grabbed onto the fence. Yeah, because they might, you know. Just just thinking about that now, like he might not have been booked, but knowing Bobby Madden, any excuse to make it about himself, yeah. he would have probably brandished the yellow anyway. But it, at no point has Bobby Madden paused to think about protecting the player in that situation. You know, people are going to be, you know, harping on about, well, he's applied the letter of the law because the mm. player's left the field of play and, you know, got himself involved. Similar if, you know, a player scores a goal and they go into the crowd, they get booked. Mm. This is a different situation altogether. He's been attacked by a fan in the crowd. And I just feel it's a, a very dangerous precedent he's now gone mm. and set because we look for levels of consistency from refereeing. And in 2016, when the Hibs fan confronted James Tavernier, James Tavernier actually pushed this Hibs fan away from him. Funzo Ojo never laid a glove or a mm. hand on the Dungeon United fan involved in this incident. James Tavernier did not receive a booking. Rightly so, to be fair. Rightly so, absolutely, yes. But in this instance, Funzo Ojo then received a yellow card, which has resulted in being sent off and then had a knock-on effect on Aberdeen's chances of winning the game. Mm. Not to say that if we had gone 11 v 10, we would have gone on to win the game because you know, we've not exactly been taking our chances when they've been coming along, mm. but it certainly hindered any opportunity we had of influencing the game because it was only two minutes after Callum Butcher had been sent off. So we hadn't even got to see how an 11 v 10 would have panned out. It is a bit of a style. The whole thing is a bit of a mental scenario. And you're right in that, Madden, it's not even like he'd gone over and explained the decision to Ojo first and sort of explained why it's happening. He just sort of brandished it immediately. Like, oh, I couldn't Ojo wait. Was, Ojo was still walking away. He didn't call him over and things and sort of explain things. He just sort of set him off. And you yeah. know it's bad when Charlie Mulgrew was being the voice of reason there and trying to calm <laughs> things down. Um, you know, unlike him, but I suppose he, he of all people would know uh, what it's like to be unfairly dismissed, I suppose. Uh, absolutely, without touching somebody as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think as well, a point I made last night when I was on the state of Scottish football was if Bobby Madden has booked Funzo Ojo because he thinks Funzo Ojo has reacted to that mm-hmm. incident, because I thought that must be the only reason, you know, at the time when we were at the game, I thought that must be the only reason that he has received a card for what's gone on there is because he's reacted to the incident. Mm-hmm. Surely as a, a, you know, he's branded as one of our better officials 
and I feel like I'm using this term very loosely after the, the weekend's performances, he has to maybe take a moment, speak to the fourth official, speak to the match stewards, speak to the police that are nearby, <clears throat> whether or not that's allowed or not, just apply some common sense to the situation and think of the welfare of those involved. And, and that's what I, you know, angers me most, that he has just thought, well, I am making up my mind. I'm not taking a second to think. Here you go. And like you said, he, he was just rushed back. And you think you, you saw Dylan McGee kind of like he was, you know, hand to the top of his head going like, what are you doing? Yeah. Mulgrew, as you, you said there, you know, being the voice of reason. I don't think the players, if, you know, Ojo hadn't got boots, I don't think the players would have blinked at all. And that, I'm speaking from a Dungeon United point of view there. I don't think so. I think Joe Lewis was up there as well at one point. But uh, no, I think you're right. It's just, it's, it's just, it's the same with the it's back to it again. I don't think that's another situation where they're not corrupt. They're just genuinely just really shit at what they do. You've mm-hmm. got to, you say apply common sense. You'd think you would there. But even if you do end up sending him off, you've got to like talk to him, explain mm-hmm. things like that. It was just the sort of, it was yeah, we didn't even have that conversation. It was exactly. like, there's a red, see you later. Exactly, then pointing him to pointing for him to leave the pitch. It was just um go back to where you were assaulted almost. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was mental and, and to be fair, I think if if that happens in the street, someone's gonna react worse. Let alone if Funso Ojo is doing his job and is then pushed and then you yeah. know, as as I think the sports scene pundit said even they wouldn't have been able to carry themselves yeah. so well. And yeah, there's certain other people on that pitch. For example, if that happens to Lewis Ferguson, could you imagine him not going and actually get involved or whatever? Whereas Lewis, Ojo is sort of more like, what the hell's going on here kind of thing. And he yeah, only finally Ojo addressed was, him. He, he did probably only did consider it. I think he did, but I think he, he saw a little bit, he saw a bit of common sense, unlike uh, Mr. Madden. But what do you expect, I suppose? Yeah, and, you know, I, I suppose we'll, we'll come we'll come into it now before before we before we move on to, to the next part. The the kind of fallout since Callum. Obviously Funzo Ojo picked up a set a second booking as a result of the incident, which means the decision cannot be appealed uh, as a result he now misses the, the game on, on Sunday. Again, you would have thought some common sense would have been applied, but common sense in Scottish football is well known not to go go hand in hand. Now, since since the incident before, the, the appeal was kind of dismissed. Aberdeen released a statement being appalled at the events. Dave Cormack very vocal on, on calling out the events and also the, the SFA to apply common sense. And and Stephen Gunn, the, the director of football, having to, to come out and almost defend what Stephen Glass said at, at full time when Stephen Glass came out and said that... Um, Funzo Ojo had let the team down or he felt Funzo Ojo had let the team down and I think that almost angers me as much as the the decision to send Funzo Ojo off I I want to see my manager defending his players in that situation not throwing them under the bus is is that fair? I would yeah I would tend to agree I think you put Stephen Glass in that situation he would react the same it would be hard not to you know, this to say confront, but he didn't really. It was, you know, it'd be hard not to have a little word back or whatever. And anyone in that situation. So I think Glass probably had to consider that. In this statement, did it not sort of suggest from Stephen Gunn that Glass has maybe now like seen it back since then and maybe he's now but, in his mind? But it's not exactly a good look that we're and it and that was the words coming from the director of football. That words weren't coming from Stephen Glass. It wasn't like if the statement had said Stephen Glass has now reviewed the footage and feels like, you know, he wants to apologise for, whatever, for yeah. saying that Funzo Ojo has let the team down. So it's not like <clears> that That words haven't come out of Stephen Glass's mouth. That's come out of the director of football's mouth. It, it just feels really disappointing that, that that's the manager's first instinct was to say, oh, you know, you know, the referees applied the letter of the law and, you know, Funzo, Funzo is, you know, he's a bit shaken, but he has let the team down. Mm-hmm. Well, what are you, like you said, what what would he have done in that situation? And do you not think he's maybe let the team down himself by he got himself sent off as well, not for the first time this season? Oh yeah, well he's been in more disciplinary trouble than Funzo Ojo has this season. Let's see how much. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a tough one, I guess. You're right, definitely right in terms of he's no he's not helped the team there. 
I think maybe he's trying to not get in any further trouble. I guess mm. maybe that's also maybe in his thinking. Obviously, yeah. just speculating, but you know, it's still it still is a little bit disappointing. I think there is ways he could have gone about it a little bit better. Even if he wasn't going to, if he was going to be a little bit more political about it, he could have mm. still defended his player a little bit more. And I think saying the least, let him down. I think that was a bit a bit off. Yeah, really. I think I think and it's that wording, and I think especially when your your club captain and in, in Joe Lewis or whatever captain he is, um this this season, you know, comes out and says, you know, players need to be protected more. You know, Joel Joe Lewis did cut a very disappointed figure at, at full time in his red TV interview, but seemed to be more protective or uh over Ojo than than his manager. And I think that for me stuck out as well um in, in reading in reading that. But but for me as well, the silence from from Tanadice is absolutely deafening. You know, Tam Courts, I'm looking at you and how vocal you were when the whole racial incident surrounding Jandro Fuchs um, occurred in the, the game against Ross County. He had the, you know, stop racism t-shirt out at full time before the full fact had been known on that that investigation. And for someone that's maybe viewed as having carried themselves very well off the field this season. His silence is deafening in the fact that he hasn't even come out to, to condemn the actions of his own supporters in this incident. And Dungeon United have released two statements. One, um, you know, stating that there was an investigation underway and a second that came out last night to say that the, the season ticket holders, um, season ticket has since been cancelled for breaking the code of conduct expected for season ticket holders. Um, but no word of apology um, from Dungeon United or Tam Courts towards Funzo Ojo, um, which I, I find very surprising. Yeah, I think obviously they are not res- directly responsible for this person's actions, but there is also, I suppose, when you're, he represents your club, there is sort of that mm. slight responsibility to like just apologise on behalf of, I guess, because clearly this boy's a moron and isn't going to do it himself. Um, but I said, I don't know. I mean, he, I suppose you're definitely right in that, that he should have, there should have been some sort of apology in there. I think, yeah, mm-hmm. As, they're not directly responsible, but there needs no. to be some sort of, they need to do it on behalf of, I guess, kind of thing, even if it's just, you know, for show. Yeah, It'll just make it look a little bit better For, in terms of their PR as well. If you're yeah. thinking about that kind of thing, like it's, it's can't look great. Yeah, no, I, I agreed, and I'm sure that the fan involved is looking forward to his court appearance as much as he is looking forward to attending the job centre uh, in the in the coming days. Because I, I hope that that shove was was worth it. But ultimately, it did have an effect on the game, Callum, and the as much as the, the main talking point from the weekend's game was that that red card incident, unfortunately, we've got to talk about another defeat. It, it's only two wins in, in 15. And yeah, it's, it's a bit depressing reading. And the, the game in the second half really kind of didn't materialise into anything. I, you know, I kept saying this has got nil-nil written mm-hmm. all over it. But Teddy Jenks, as we, we touched on, probably had our best chance. I'm not sure if he, he could have done much better with it. I don't think so. I think it was um, a bit of a snapshot kind of thing and, you know, hard to get past Big Benji Seagrest. And, mm. you know, he's a good goalkeeper. I think he's probably the best. Get it on target and hope for the best. Um, yeah. Was that a good time for him as well? Yeah, very true. But, you know, frustrating, but as you say, probably the yeah, best chance, chance the second half. One of the very few I can even think of. Um, which is very very frustrating as you say we thought we had nil nil written all over it we were wrong I would have taken mm. nil nil in hindsight <laughs> yeah well especially we were wrong considering how generous our defence is or how generously we are giving up goals this season mm. um, and before I get into the goal itself I, I want to just run this stat by you Callum I'm, I'm, I've taken it from Jim Douglas's Twitter account uh, I won't plagiarise his work I commend his stat finding um, and it's the, the shot on targets to goals for Aberdeen's recent games. So against Dungeon United, they had two shots on target, one Ooh. goal. Against Motherwell, two shots, two goals. Hearts, one shot on target, one goal. Rangers had four shots on target, scored twice. Hibs didn't have any. Dundee had three shots on target, scored twice. Celtic, two, scored twice. St Mirren, four, scored three times. St Johnston once scored once in those games that Jim selected it's 19 shots on target 14 goals conceded 
and it, it's that kind of soft nature or or that's really coming back to haunt us it's interesting because it sounds like we're limiting them and um, to chances to be fair but then the chances they are afforded so have seemed so clear-cut and almost impossible to miss as was basically the case um on saturday in 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 that joe lewis left his goal wide open of course like no the cross that wasn't his problem that wasn't him to deal with that you know there's many other issues but he left the whole goal wide open as long as harks hits the target there and it's not within a yard of joe lewis then it's a goal and yeah that's what happened it's just it's so frustrating it's almost comical now if you sort of if you don't laugh you'll cry kind of sense exactly the words i used in our group chat last night was that if you don't laugh at that defending for the 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 goal then you will cry because of how depressing our our current form is but i suppose the goal in the build up once again was avoidable because my longstaff a player i i just seem to always have to criticise on this show mm-hmm. that Dally's in possession and Hottie dispossesses him and Louis Perry runs free on Aberdeen's goal and Joe Lewis, I, I don't know if you want to call it a good save, he gets fortunate that it goes on to the post and, and goes behind for a corner mm-hmm. because certainly at the, you know, at the game I was definitely thinking he maybe should have held it. Um, but it, again, it just on, on, on Longstaff just once again shows he's just not up to the pace of Scottish football. Mm-hmm. You don't have the luxury of that time on the ball as you do down south. And United crowded him out, won the ball back well. But again, another point I made on the bus home. Yes, it was poor from Longstaff to concede the corner. But fuck me, defend it. Come on. It's exactly the same as, you know, the situation at Ibrox with the contentious free kick that Lewis Ferguson gave away for the first goal. Mm-hmm. Whether or not it should have come about, you can defend the thing. Yeah. I think it's a catalogue of errors. Um, I don't know what long staff was playing out there. Um, decided to try, sort of try to take on like three men at once. Um, not sure what that was about. How, if he can't get in and perform in this Aberdeen team, he'll ever be expected to do so in a Premier League side that's just been taken over by multi-billionaire owners, I have no idea. But um, that's for another day. And then even what after that, and then Lewis kind of gets this save, but it's not a good save. He tips, doesn't have to tip onto the post, granted, and it goes out for a corner. You know, so that's a little bit of an error. He could have maybe gathered it. And then if we don't clear the goal, we don't clear the corner. It's a, it's a terrible ball in, let's be yeah. honest. I think it got maybe a little flick on from Mulgrew or something at the near post. And then <coughs> Lewis leaves his goal wide open. So there's sort of like four th- opportunities to prevent that goal happening there. And none of them are taken. Um, which is just horrendous. And then Harks just gets it goal words and then it obviously goes in that's all he had to do just had to hit the target yeah. and it actually was quite a nice finish to be fair but mm-hmm. oh frustrating and it was at that stage that I uh, left the stadium was that, I, was, I wonder where you disappeared to yeah um, disappeared left the stadium was, okay, well. was there was no point I thought the, there was no way we were going to score even at no, the, to be honest, there could have been no chance we were going to score even if we had 11 men the whole the second half let alone it's 0-0 sure. then we're 1-0 down and I saw oh, there's no point now go and get a but, couple couple beverages yeah well fair enough but on the on the goal itself the the corner i mean it's just once again a shambles defensively we didn't cover ourselves in glory against motherwell um you know defending a set piece but but loose is dr- almost drawn to that near post and it was a point that fraser wallace mentioned to me last night um and it was the fact the way that charlie mulgrew makes that run you said whether he gets a flick on fraser thought he dummied it but it's almost Joe Lewis is obsessed with what Mulgrew's doing mm. and he's following the run of Charlie Mulgrew to cover the near post in case Mulgrew gets the flick and that's why the goal is so wide open mm-hmm. and Marley Watkins and Christian Ramirez are almost admiring how shit the corner actually was and Watkins practically watches it pass him and fall to the feet of um uh, Ian Harks and, and Dean Campbell's again at the back post caught ball watching and yeah it's a good finish but it couldn't have been an emptier net for him to try no. if he wanted and <laughs> I, I did have to laugh though you, you obviously had left at this point but a, a few minutes after the, there was a couple of old guys in, in front of where we were sitting and uh, he was shouting down to the touchline saying that Stephen Glasses is all your fault and uh, I turned to him and said uh, 
you know he's not been on you know he's not been in the dugout since half time he got himself sent off I well he's still responsible for the substitutions that have been made he's still responsible for bringing these players to the club and also McInnes wouldn't have lost us this game and that was my cue to leave oh yeah because I was just like you know what I cannot because he's gone deal with it whether or not he wouldn't have lost us that game probably would have given the the external circumstances that surrounded the situation but get over it yes our our current run of forms not exactly encouraging right now but at, at what point does do people start getting behind this manager or is it always going to be against him because he's not hit the ground running and that's kind of what I'm feeling right now is the fact that well you know we did have it quite good the style of football was terrible but I'm not liking the results so I'm just going to just blame it on that now whilst I agree with what you've just said there that man's point about the substitutions okay we're forced at some of them etc but what has Austin Samuels got to do to get off that bench yeah and whatever wage Jets on I'm willing to get to a big one What's he got to do to get involved with? When we're not creating anything, try something new, maybe, every now mm. and then. Not happening, which is frustrating, yeah. which is very frustrating. Yeah, the, the, the subs, I mean, Terry Jenks, like I said, he had our, our best chance of the second half. Johnny Hayes came on, tried to get a ball into the box, but nine times at town, failed to beat the first man. Usual. And if it did beat the first man, didn't beat the second. You know, it was just, just nothing happened. My only thing is when we're down to 10 men, I wouldn't have brought Jet on because it'd been like playing with nine men but that's just my opinion uh, again I totally agree on Austin Samuels when you maybe want that bit of pace injection what's he got to do to, to you know he showed what he can do give him give him that that opportunity but yeah and, and it, for me on on the you know the whole managerial point my frustration is is it's almost as indiscipline continuously getting himself sent off and there probably will be a touchline ban incoming and you know when he is a new coach and he's obviously trying to instill new ideas you're wanting it to be him that gets across not just not as coaching staff because can they convey it in the same way and even then some of them sometimes they're getting themselves sent off as well which is not great <laughs> but i suppose your manager doing your your, your boss doing that sets the president and um, i suppose mm -hmm. but you know yeah, it's not right. I do agree with those concerns, but also just on on just Austin Sand Austin Sandals things really annoy me. People, you he might not be the end product, mm. whatever, but he is what twenty years old. He's mm. obviously going to be raw. He's not played a lot of games, but how do you get better with the experience? And he, there yeah. obviously is something there. He's capable, and um, certainly no worse than some of the rest of them that have been out there. Um, mm -hmm. just very very frustrating so hopefully the next time Stephen Glass is on the touchline for 90 minutes he decides to bring him on that would be nice yeah well I wonder if we'll see him at, at Parkhead um, on Sunday obviously that's where the Dons head to continue uh, look for an improvement in, in results and uh, not exactly the place you want to go um, this season and, and you know we've only used two wins in 15 as I said and one away win domestically this season and that's only thanks to to Livingston chucking the ball in the net in the 93rd minute that we have won that uh, away game from home um, in Scotland this season Ross County as well are the only team that have actually lost more games than us in the league this season that's how kind of poor our form has been over recent weeks and on a season as a whole so Callum do you think the pressure is on Stephen Glass going into this weekend's game or do you think it's a bit of a free hit? You know, kind of the, the way we discussed about the, the game at Ibrox earlier, uh, last was it last month? Feels like months ago. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was the end of, yeah, it was the 27th of October. Where did my memory go? That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Only reason I remember that is because I was at the starts then. But oh. it's, um, I don't know. I, I put it this way, I'm not going there expecting anything. Well, I say going there, not bothering going, there's no point. <laughs> no, um, about 30 quid a ticket to be have a pillar in front of you for most of it. Very true. But I, your I think not, not, not expecting anything from this game. However, another loss, just no matter who it's against, sort of just compiles the misery and obviously does increase the pressure naturally. Um, albeit mm -hmm. this is like one, you know, maybe the toughest one, second toughest fixture you could have. Yeah. Um, you know it doesn't help but it's just not not what you want after a couple of bad results again 
after we'd sort of stuck things together somewhat uh, for a week. Um, it's funny how that only lasted a week, mind you. Yeah, I know. Look at everyone that was excited to get the international break over and get bring it back. back. Bring it back. I miss Lyndon Dykes and Shea Adams. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I kind of agree. I think there's not there's not pressure on us in a in a sense, and you know the, what you say about it being a tough venue to, to go to. But equally, a defeat will you know, louden those that are not wanting glass at the club and will put that bit of extra pressure on him going into what I view as the more important games mm. um, of the this kind of triple header, the, 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 the Livingston and St Mirren games coming up because these are teams that are cu- currently right in about us yeah. points-wise within three at either side. So, you know, we're, we're wanting to make sure that we don't get dragged into a relegation battle or... Just now, we don't let Simon and get too far ahead of us in the race for getting into the top six, as mm-hmm. strange as that sounds to be saying at the, the end of November. But it, it, it's it's a difficult one to say because I do think this game, we're probably not expected to win. So anything we do take from it is a bonus. Mm-hmm. But a, a disappointing defeat or a, or a heavy defeat will certainly you know increase pressure. But you've also got to be realistic given probably the team that we're going to end up having to field given the suspensions and injuries we're carrying going into this game yeah very true I think a lot of the time so far this season I've been looking at performance rather than results trying to be a little bit more positive yeah, which is absolutely. weird for me I think this is another one where that sort of matters because if we do go in and put in a decent performance against them you know we go to Parkhead you very rarely come, come away with a, a decent result especially us in recent in recent <laughs> years but um I think we, we've got to look at the performance and then hopefully we can take that into, as you say, the more important games. Whether we will do that or not, who knows? That remains to be seen. And I wouldn't say I'm confident about that, but <laughs> I think that's sort of what we've got to look forward to. That's, you know, put a little positive spin on for you for you all at home there. No, I think I'll leave it on, on that summary because I think you've you've done a good job there. And I think as that's what probably annoyed me more at the weekend was that the, the performance wasn't, positive and neither was a result and obviously the other circumstances further fuel to that that fire of anger but but if we have if we have sold going to Pataudry to you during this episode uh, get us into marketing if we have but the mid-season tickets are on sale at Pataudry starting from just £20 for under 12s these are valid from the Boxing Day game against Dundee. So if you don't, uh, if you want to get involved at Pataudry, then uh, look look at that. It's 185 for an adult in the red shed, and 35 is the cheapest under 18 mid season ticket available in the silver sections. That under 12 price for 20 pounds is in the silver section as well. So look look for them if you want to get involved with a mid season ticket. But maybe we've done a good job on selling you and getting down to getting down to Pataudry this season. But if not, as we said, mentioned at the, the, the top of the show, there is that chance to win tickets to the Boxing Day game against Dundee in our raffle coming up next week. And joining us to preview the game on Sunday is Colin Watt, as usual. Well, Colin, welcome back to Red Tinted Glasses. You must be buoyed by the weekend's performance and, and getting to the first domestic final of the season. Well, Glenn, I look happy. <laughs> I look content. Stop asking stupid questions. And <laughs> no, it's, that was that was um, it was a great weekend overall. Uh, Glenn, a spirited performance by Celtic. It has to be said. Um, I think you've you've put it just before we were come on here. Professional in the fact that they got the the job over the line. It was looking sort of touch and go as to whether it might go to extra time, um, and then getting that goal, getting well, I say getting having that result on Sunday. Mm-hmm. It, it was pretty much a perfect weekend if you're a Celtic fan overall but um, another final to look forward to and unfortunately for St Johnston the reign as champions is, is now over yeah the, the cup specialists crash out and I, I said we didn't even rehearse that little introduction there Colin it was, better, <laughs> better. It was seamless <laughs> but for Ange Postacoglu and, and, and Celtic supporters in particular it must be so uh, maybe a relief that they've got to that final, especially for Ange. And, you know, just thinking towards the game on, on Sunday coming up for from Celtic, they've got buoyed by that momentum of getting to a cup final. Obviously, we're recording this on Tuesday ahead of a, mm-hmm. a big European clash against Bayer Leverkusen. But, you know, the momentum's there with Celtic. And, you know, from my point of view, we're, Aberdeen are coming into this game a bit depleted and, and once again low on confidence. 
I think you have to look back to it, but when Aberdeen went to Ibrox, because I think they're in a very similar situation. Depleted injury wise, everybody was kind of writing them off because Rangers were on a fairly decent run of form at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't a case of can you get anything out of the game. It almost felt like damage limitation before the game had even started. Yeah. And then you see the sort of performance that can be put in when the chips are down at Aberdeen, and that sort of turned turned it around for a couple of weeks at least. Mm-hmm. But you're looking at a Celtic side who they've only conceded one goal at home in the league this season, so. If Aberdeen were to go there and get a couple, it would be a big surprise. And that's mm. that's not a dig at Aberdeen at all. It's just the way that the kind of form book would say going forward. Um, as you say, Celtic having to travel to Leverkusen on Thursday night and then come back and play in, on Sunday could be a couple of weary legs. It depends how much uh, Ange decides to sort of mix the team up a bit. If players could potentially come back from injury, mm. we know there's a couple <clears> that sort of touch and go to be back within the next seven to ten days including um, I hate saying this on an Aberdeen podcast but Tom Rodgick um, You like to get his name in every time you're on here <laughs> I, I feel I give some people nightmares every time I say his name um, and I apologise for that You but, don't though <laughs> No, not really <laughs> um, it's, it's a big week for Celtic you've got Leverkusen on Thursday night you've got Aberdeen on Sunday and then Hearts come to Celtic Park on Thursday night as well so there's a lot of football to be fit in in the next seven days and I think that's the way December's just going to go you're going to be two or three days between games I think Celtic's got ten games in total mm-hmm. uh, between now and um, basically January 2nd when the, the next Rangers game is so there's a lot of football to be played and Celtic don't necessarily have the strongest depth of squad at the moment it's not as if you can just turn to someone like Yakamatis to come on and maybe mm-hmm. play 90 minutes because we've not seen the performances from him so far this season to suggest that he would be the one to go to. But the likes of James Forrest coming back fit, guys like Rodjick, um, even near Beaton putting in a couple of decent performances, it's, it's positive um, overall. And as you say, getting that first cup final, if you'd offered someone that after perhaps the first couple of games of Ange Postacoglu's reign, they would have Mm. took it with both hands but the way and the momentum that Celtic are carrying at the moment they've deserved it and they've earned their way into that final and there'll be lots of um, Celtic fans desperate for Ange to lift that trophy on December 19th even just to give him a wee wham sing along yeah, and I think you know that that stat you you just produced there about the fact that Dungeon Knight, uh, sort of, well, Dungeon Knight are the only team then to score at Parkhead. You know, Celtic mm-hmm. just conceding the once. It was a stat I never realised, but probably coupled with the stat that we produced earlier in the, in the show. And unfortunately, Cal not joining us for this segment. But Aberdeen have only won one away game domestically all season, and that was when Max Rechek chucked the ball in the back of the net. It's, it's not exactly the. F- Celtic Park's not exactly the place you want to be to be going when your away form is as dreadful as it is, let alone, you know, the injuries and suspensions we're, we're currently carrying. Funzo Ojo suspended, given the shambolic um, stuff from Bobby that's, Madden. That's pathetic. That is absolutely <laughs> pathetic, by the way. Uh, I, I, I can't come up with the words to describe how bad a decision that is. And if there was ever ever a suggestion that Scottish referees are doing a good job, they only need to take a look at that one decision. I'm not just saying that because a lot of people will say, oh, Celtic and Rangers fans, they just moan about referees constantly mm. and how one's a Rangers fan and one's a Celtic fan and this <laughs> and that and the next thing. Not the standard of Scottish refereeing is dreadful, mm-hmm. absolutely dreadful. And I think everybody's kind of banking on this introduction of VER as if it's going to be yeah. a god save to Scottish football. The first thing we need to do and Douglas Ross knows this very well because he's been hiding <laughs> his expenses, is to make the referees full time and give them proper training. Mm. I mean, it's it must be difficult, and I'm, I feel as if I'm defending referees here. I feel a bit sick <laughs> doing this, but when you look at it, these guys are working a full-time job, mm-hmm. and then they're maybe travelling on a Wednesday night up to Dingwall from yeah. Glasgow to referee a game, to then travel home, to then work the next day. And the, the footballers don't do that. No. So why should our referees be part-time as well? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's enough money in Scottish football to make refereeing f- a full-time job. Yeah, uh-huh. As I said, Douglas Ross is well aware of that. <laughs> um, so th- there's no need for us to still be at this day and age in 2021, get into 2022, mm-hmm. with part-time referees at the highest level of Scottish football. Yeah. We have to make them full-time and then things like VAR will improve the standard even further. But yeah. one step at a time. Yeah, yeah, and so obviously, as I said, Ojo was suspended due to that that shambolic decision. 
um, maybe player than words that I used from earlier in the episode. <laughs> I'm not sure on Calvin Ramsey's fitness. Obviously, he missed the game on Saturday, and there was talk he should hopefully be fit for this weekend. Um, we might see Jack Gurr continue at, at right back. I know we're going to come on to our, our predicted 11s towards the, the end of the show, but Jack McKenzie possibly rushed back as well, picking up uh, an injury right on half time. So Aberdeen defensively, David Bates from missing out with COVID, Declan Gallagher and the rest of our, our defence sitting on the sidelines. <laughs> defensively, we're really struggling. And, you, you know, you talk about Celtic's lack of depth. Aberdeen have a real lack of depth. The fact that we've been having to play Scott Brown as centre-back for the last five games is, you know, talk enough of our lack of depth. Similar Ross McCrory, we're, we're not actually playing a recognised centre-half at, at centre-half just mm-hmm. now. And although I know you'll probably think that, well, you'll probably be hoping that David Bates is is playing this weekend because I know how much you're a fan of of, of him uh, after he, his role in gifting Kyogo the opener at, at Pataudry when the teams last met. But on Kyogo and um, Yota and obviously the, the returning James Forrest, which we saw at the weekend, you made a point there about will Ange potentially rest players after this this Leverkusen games, you know, Celtic have got a busy schedule coming up. Given Aberdeen's run of form, do Celtic risk underestimating Aberdeen by resting players? We obviously saw how Celtic got mm-hmm. punished against Livingston. I mean, there's always that opportunity and that's the kind of balance you've got to try and take. As I said, 10 games in 30 days is a lot. I mean, you're talking, you're, you're probably in between playing games, you've maybe got 24 hours recovery, mm. which isn't a lot, especially if you've got maybe that niggling injury. And I think Aberdeen's schedule isn't much lighter than Celtic's. I think they've maybe got eight games in that time. So yeah, well, I know we've got the, we've got the obviously, yourselves on Sunday and then mm-hmm. St Mirren midweek, no, Livingston midweek, apologies, and then St Mirren on, on the, the Saturday and then it's, uh, we've got a week in between all the games well actually we've got a little bit of space now because of the, the cup final so after the 11th of December our next game is not until the 22nd so mm-hmm. we're actually a bit lucky going into that kind of hectic Boxing Day 29th second fixture period so yeah but it's just it's the way the, the December calendar always works and if you do well in cup competitions or Europe your calendar's congested <laughs> That's it I mean when you look at it to suggest playing ten games in December is a good schedule for Scottish football. Is not, it's not, it's not the best way to go. Considering everybody knows what Scottish weather is going to be like, there's every chance one of those ten games will get called off for mm-hmm. some reason. Um, but I think I understand that the reason they've had to do it and reschedule the likes of the game that was set for the cup final weekend is because of the World Cup next year. Okay. So they can't so really kind of games in. Yeah, so mm-hmm. because the season's finishing quite early this year as well, so yeah. they're just finding the time to get stuff like that. Scotland doing well in the, the World Cup qualifiers probably doesn't help that yeah. either. So, um, <laughs> you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't, sort the of price thing. of success, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but yeah, they could they could underestimate Aberdeen, um, because Rangers definitely did at mm-hmm. Highbrooks. As I said, no one expected Aberdeen to go 2 0 up. No. Um, and the fact that you guys didn't come away from that game with three points still is a- another example of how poor Scottish refereeing can be. Mm-hmm. Um, when you look at it, Aberdeen still got some some threats down the wings. Guys like McGinn Ramirez um, offer that, th- and some people may kind of laugh at the idea of McGinn, but he always, for me, puts on a performance when Celtic come. And I disagree comes, on that. <laughs> oh, I, I generally do. He's always one that. If Celtic, say for example, Celtic have a corner and the ball breaks out, the last person we want it to fall to is a John McGinn to kind of... Uh, Niall John McGinn. And, 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 and I'll right have, have John McGinn in there. <laughs> um, but Niall McGinn, because he's got the pace to get beyond what is not necessarily the most mobile of Celtic defences. Um, and Ramirez kind of putting himself about will be a bit of a concern, especially when we've seen what sort of happens when um, Stephen Welsh comes up against a big physical uh, forward. He's not the most comfortable at times, so mm-hmm. there is still a threat to be had there. As you said, I think Lewis Ferguson potentially back for this game as well. Yeah, he was suspended at the weekend, so we'll, we'll slot back into the midfield given Ojo's absence. So, yeah. And, well, I know you're you're not Ferguson's biggest fan. You think he flashed <laughs> deceived at time, but I think you know we've touched on it plenty of times on this show before, we're not really sure what's going to happen to him come the January transfer window. He's got a, a run of games to maybe 
put himself into that shop window if he's wanting wanting a move away from the club and no better time to start putting in those levels of performances against the likes of Celtic. Absolutely, and you look at it, he's getting in amongst the Scotland squad now, so yeah. he'd want to stay there, especially with the, the playoffs coming up. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of players that have got the chance to step up and impress over the next couple of weeks. Um, Aberdeen can be a, a threat to Celtic on Sunday. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I mean, it depends what style of football Glass wants to come to Celtic Park and play. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think we spoke about this the last time you were very disappointed in the way that Glass set his team up against Celtic at Pataudry because first 45 anyway yeah, yeah. first 45 mm-hmm. because it went away from the style of football that everyone although the results weren't there everyone was sort of saying it's a great style of football it's what you yeah. want to see um, and then in the second half obviously they did come out they got the goal um, and it was the kind of style of football you wanted to see, but then mm-hmm. it tailed off towards the end. The legs sort of got heavy and that's when Celtic pounced on it at the end. Yep. You come to Celtic Park and everybody says the thing about coming to Celtic Park's the big pitch. I think that's just a, a mental thing. I don't think yeah. it's that much bigger than most of the other pitches in Scottish football. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you look at it, Celtic averaged 73% possession each game. That's mm-hmm. a ridiculous stat. The fact that you've got the ball for three quarters of the game, basically. Mm-hmm. And Aberdeen's stat isn't much lower than that. It's fifty eight percent. So the two teams that like to get the ball and keep the ball and pass it about. Obviously, as you're saying, it's a bit difficult with the injuries that's gone through um, mm-hmm. Aberdeen at the minute. But if Stephen Glass sticks to his style of football, Posta Coglu is not going to change from his style of football. No. You could have a very interesting game in that sense. Yeah. Or you could have a game where Aberdeen open themselves up. And Celtic take advantage of it. It's one of those risks that you're you're kind of looking at it going, do you take it, do you not? As an Aberdeen fan, do you see this as a free hit for Stephen Glass this weekend? Well, it's funny because it's something that, that me and Callum spoke about before um, you know, you joined us to to do the the preview for this game. I, I, I don't know. I kind of personally I hate having this feeling, but I kind of do think it is a free hit. It was similar when we went to Ibrox earlier in the season. I felt it was a free hit for Stephen Glass. I suppose there's maybe an expectation that we're not expected as much as fans we want us to win three points when mm-hmm. we, we travel to Glasgow. There's maybe certain expectations that we we won't pick up those three points as much as people are probably shouting at me for, for saying that. I think it's just the way maybe the, the club operates that they, they don't expect. But I think for me, the the bigger games and more important games for, and this is what I was saying to in the in the in our group chat last night with the rest of the state of Scottish football folk is the bigger games for from in my point of view is the game on Wednesday and and the following Saturday against Livingston and St Mirren because mm-hmm. these are the teams that are currently closer to us. A, a point I've touched on about about St Mirren currently occupying the, the that space in the in the top six. We're just two points behind them, so we want to, you know, maintain on on their coattails at, at this moment in time. Livingston all obviously be looking above, um, and and looking to catch Aberdeen. So for me, those games coming up are more important. And if we can avoid defeat in those games, you know, I, I think you know you'd be looking at minimum of four. Well, really, it should be a minimum of six from Livingston mm-hmm. and, and St Mirren, and then anything we take from this weekend is, is a bonus. I think that was the same way that many looked at that triple header with Hearts, Rangers and uh, Hibernian. Mm-hmm. Six points was to be the minimum and anything else we got was a bonus. I think when you look at that though, if that is the case, then it sort of takes the pressure off a lot of the players. Yeah, because you, you've you not, you've got obviously the injury concerns, you've got the suspensions, but then you're coming to Celtic Park and then you're not kind of panicking once you're 1-0 down because you've mm. got that sort of, um, the, the, the kind of thing it's like, well, we weren't really expected to take something yeah. from this. Let's just concentrate on our game and see what we can get out of it. Um, and Livingston, when they came to Celtic Park a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. they yeah. managed to get themselves a, a foothold in the game. Um, they, they sort of dug themselves in deep. They were resilient. Uh, they forced Celtic wide. Celtic put in 40 crosses that game. <laughs> and the, uh, I mean, obviously we didn't score, but none of them were necessarily perfect crosses. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So, they do have to sort of mix this up a bit and if Aberdeen can sort of slow Celtic down because yeah. Celtic want to play at a fast tempo 
you get the ball out to guys like Forrest, Abada, Jota, even playing the ball in behind to Kyogo. If mm-hmm. Aberdeen can slow the game down and frustrate Celtic, then there's every chance that they can come away with something. I mean, you've got guys like Ryan Hedges playing. Anything can happen. I'm really a big fan of Ryan Hedges. I think he's Aberdeen's best player. And don't you go um, a bid in in January, by the way? Oh, <laughs> probably not. Uh, um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of transfer speculation, but... I, I really think Hedges is when Hedges plays well Aberdeen play well mm. um, and I've been really impressed with him what I was surprised at last season was how infrequently he was used mm. I, I feel as if especially under McInnes I, I don't think he really took a shine to him but well, I think it was last season was obviously picked up the pictorial muscle injury that, that ruled him out yeah. for about six months and he struggled getting back to, to full fitness after that but no I do agree I think when he is on form, Aberdeen are on form. And I think Marley Watkins coming into the side as well has also helped us going forward. And, you know, you, you mentioned there Stephen Walsh um, earlier struggles with a physical presence. Uh, hopefully if, if we if we go with two up top uh, again on Sunday, then it, it, he won't just have one to worry about in Christian mm-hmm. Ramirez. He'll have two in Marley Watkins as well. And Marley Watkins has pace to burn as well as being a physical threat. Well, that's the thing as well. I think with Watkins, he will be... He'll play behind Ramirez, mm-hmm. I think, on Saturday. Um, but you Sunday, sorry. Line up here. <laughs> I've not seen it yet, no. <laughs> um, but on Sunday, I, I think he'll play behind Ramirez and I think his job will be to not stop running for 90 minutes mm. because you want Ramirez to be your out ball um, and you want Watkins to play off him. But mm-hmm. they, they are going to have to sit in. They are going to have to chase the ball down. They are going to have to close Celtic down a lot. Yeah. And having Watkins to do that is going to be massive for Aberdeen. Mm-hmm. Um, when you look at it guys like G. Emmanuel Thomas he's not going to do that running for you no. Ramirez necessarily isn't going to do that running for you um, and if you are without the fullback options as well mm-hmm. then Watkins is going to have to cover a lot of the park so yeah. he'll be an important one to have in there but you're also looking to have a couple of experienced heads in there as well what's the latest on Johnny Hayes because I think he was always the kind of go-to man under Neil Lennon when they needed a bit of experience in there. Mm-hmm. I think he's sort of done that role for Stephen Glass as well, obviously coming on at the weekend there. So do you think he might start? Again, I'm questioning whether or not you've got 2020 <laughs> vision and have seen what I've written down. But I think we saw that it's an excellent point you make about kind of the trust that Stephen Glass has shown in Johnny Hayes and in terms of his experience because we saw him come in at Ibrox at you, you say Marley Watkins is going to be the player that's tasked to run about for eight minutes. I actually think it's going to be Johnny Hayes this weekend because we're still kind of managing Marley Watkins' fitness. And this is my concern for later on in the week, uh, next week with the run of three games of how Marley Watkins' body is going to be able to cope with that important set of fixtures. So I think there'll be maybe more emphasis on Johnny Hayes. Mm-hmm. So he's used to playing at Parkhead and maybe got a point to prove after being released in the summer. I know it's maybe accepted that his time was up at Parkhead, but you know he's maybe still better about and wants to show that he was or is still capable of putting in a performance. It was certainly a player that I felt let himself down when the teams met at Pataudry mm-hmm. first 45. So I think we might see him maybe deployed further forward than what he was at Pataudry and kind of be tasked with that just just to buzz around midfield and be kind of a bit of a nuisance. But I just wanted to, to take back to a point you were making earlier, Colin, about, you know, the data Dons has more of a ring to it than data Celtic, you know, in terms of like the possession stats that, that Celtic like to keep. But what what in particular from the games against Livingston and Dungeon United, what, what was it that those teams did right in terms of frustrating Celtic? Or was it just... You know, you know, I think back to the Livingston game, obviously, the, the missed penalty. Was it just a case mm-hmm. that it was one of those days for Celtic? Or were were these teams getting stuff right and f- just causing Celtic too much frustration? Well, first of all, I have to take the blame for the Livingston result. I wasn't mm-hmm. on the park, <laughs> but I was in hospitality. Oh, and yeah. I've been at hospitality at Celtic Park four or five times now. And every time I've been, they've finished nil-nil. I should have known beforehand. I should have went to the bookies and stuck it on. Um, and I did. I did actually say to you, I said I was going to get your hospitality for this game of the weekend. <laughs> well, I'm still waiting on that ticket coming through, so we'll see how, how that ends up. Um, but no, it was, what Livingston did particularly well was play to their strengths, and their strengths was their, their back two, mm-hmm. the, the two centre halves, because they're big, they're physical in the air, and they won everything. And yeah. Jack and Mattis was just not up for the battle that afternoon. 
Um, the balls were getting put out wide to both um, Juranovic, Jota, uh, Ralston, uh, whoever was out on the, the flanks at that point. And the crosses were coming over and they weren't the worst of crosses, but all you had in there was Yakimatis. So if he didn't win it, there wasn't someone to play off him. Yeah. So what you do notice is if you go back to the semi-final um, win at the weekend, mm-hmm. the goal obviously comes from a cross. Yeah. But you've got Kyogo going front post. Mm-hmm. You've got Forrest who's cut across and is in the middle. And you've got David Turnbull who's just behind as well. Mm-hmm. So they do have to have more options if they are going to put crosses into the box. Otherwise, they're going to have to get it so that it goes to the byline and it's a ball back across. Yeah. And there is very talented individuals at Celtic. You take a look at some of the goals that Celtic scored at Dens Park a couple of weeks ago and it just shows you, I mean, Kyogo's second goal is just a, a beautiful piece of skill mm-hmm. from both Jota, from Kyogo himself. It's one of those goals that you could watch back again and again because of the, the technique that's involved. Mm-hmm. But sometimes that is not always on show. Yeah. And if you can catch Celtic on an off day like Livingston did mm-hmm. and just force them wide and it's almost like a turgid performance. You get the fans sort of restless yeah. and things like that will happen. Should Celtic have came away from that game with three points? Probably. I mean, you don't mm-hmm. miss penalties. You should never miss a penalty yeah. as a professional footballer, mm-hmm. but it was terribly taken. Um yeah, the goalkeeper was off his line, but even if he'd retaken it, he'd have probably missed it. So it's just a case of another one of those days for Celtic. They can't afford to have any more. And mm. if they want to keep going for the title this season, yeah. I think Rangers will get a slight bounce off uh, Van Bronckhorst. Mm-hmm. I don't think necessarily it will be a massive bounce. I don't think you'll see a massive turn in performance. I mean, the week before Gerard leaves, they win 6 1 at Motherwell. So, mm. what are they going to do? Are they going to put 10 past Livingston or something like that? What yeah. is the improvement? <laughs> Obviously, they, they lose to Hibs, but there is a there is a massive gap shown in Scottish football just now mm. um, where you've got the sort of top six where obviously Aberdeen want to be just now. Yep. And then you've got the bottom six. And sometimes when teams come up against the bottom six sides, you're seeing these big results. Like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you see another couple where Hearts maybe score five and Celtic score six and Rangers score yeah. six and whatever because there is a bit of a gap in Scottish football at the minute and it's the biggest I've certainly seen in a, a number of seasons mm-hmm. but it's, it's, it's Scottish football in it it's just one of those things that it's why we love it <laughs> in it, a weird way <laughs> between that they, it could be two different games where Celtic play let's, say, let's take St Mirren for example mm-hmm. Celtic could play St Mirren on the Saturday and win 6 0 at Celtic Park. Yeah. They could then go to St. Mirren Park on the Wednesday night and they could draw 0 0. Yeah. And that's that's just the way Scottish football is. Yeah. Um, no, and I think, you know, the points you, you've made are, are really good. And I think kind of the point you made about frustrating the home fans or the, mm-hmm. the home fans getting restless is a point that me and Callum have made previously when ahead of that trip to Ibrox. And I think it's going to be the same again. How much can we get the, the Green Brigade turning and, and that leads on to the rest of Celtic Park turning as well? And how clinical can Aberdeen be when they get the, the chances? We were so clinical in that first half at Ibrox and we've got to put in that, that same performance. I think there's a reason that Aberdeen are down as 10 to 1, um, you know, second favourites for this game. <laughs> uh, and interestingly, if you want a double with, with Livingston this weekend, it's 109 to 1 for both Livingston and Aberdeen to, to come away with, with victories. And I think, yeah, it'll be interesting as well that obviously Celtic Aberdeen kicks off at, at three o'clock on, mm-hmm. on Sunday, um, which is after the Rangers have gone to Almond Vale uh, and played Livingston. So whether or not there will be kind of an incentive for Celtic there to maybe catch or capitalise on any drop points but equally pressure on Celtic if Rangers do go and get that three points and how that in turn affects the game but equally if Livingston go and get a positive result they're right back on Aberdeen's coattails Mm -hmm. again applying pressure to Aberdeen to go and get a result because we're suddenly going to find ourselves looking back over our shoulders again instead of after you know the the game against Hearts, we were we were looking up the table, so we're kind of stuck in limbo from from an Aberdeen point of view. But we'll round off the the episode um, as we normally do when you join us, Colin, with our with our predicted eleven. So as the home side, I'll, I'll let you go first. Uh, so I've gone with the ever reliable Joe Hart and goal. Mm-hmm. Uh, although reliable is maybe not the word that some people were using at the <laughs> weekend. Uh, 
I'll stick with the back four of Ralston, Carter Vickers, Welsh and Juranovic playing at left back. Uh, the midfield three is one that I've swayed over because we're still waiting on some players returning from injury. Mm-hmm. But as it stands here on the Tuesday of recording this, I've gone with uh, Beaton, McGregor and Turnbull. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a forward three of Jota, James Forrest and Kyogo. Mm-hmm. No place for Leo Abadas, yeah, we're injured just now. He's bad as one of these players where if he has a great first 20 minutes, he has a great game. Mm. But if he has a poor first 20 minutes, he sort of fades in and out of games. Right. Um, and to be honest, he's only 19-20. So um, the fact that he's already made such an impact at Celtic is is outstanding. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he'll be one that will be managed very carefully between now and the end of the season. Mm. Having James Forrest back, that was his 96th goal for Celtic at the weekend. Mm. So... I think he's very close to getting both 100 goals and 100 assists. No. We'll probably see that this season. So I think is, we'll see this on Sunday. I'll say, I <laughs> Who knows? Um, but he is someone that Celtic can turn to and on these kind of bigger games. Mm-hmm. And I mean, having someone like Leela Bada to come off the bench, that's always a great option. Yeah. Yeah, well, as I said, Aberdeen take a kind of depleted defence down to, to Parkhead and we're certainly low on confidence. We'll be looking to something to inspire us and I think Joe Lewis will retain his place in goal. I know there's question marks over his goalkeeping at, at, at the weekend, but I've gone with, I'm hoping Calvin Ramsey is going to be fit. So I've got stuck him down at, at right back because, you know, personally, I did think Jack Gerd did all right at the weekend. I know it's maybe a controversial opinion, but we're a better side with Calvin Ramsey at right back than, than Jack Gerd yeah, anyway. Big fan of Ramsey. Very big fan of yeah. Ramsey. Um, and obviously David Bates has been out with, with COVID. I'm not sure if he'll be fully fit. So I've stuck. I'm gone with a 4-4-2. Um, so Scott Brown and Ross McCrory as my, my centre-backs that aren't centre-backs and Dean Campbell as left-back. Again, that's just on the basis that I don't think Jack McKenzie is going to be fit for the weekend. Uh, Ryan Hedges on the right wing with Lewis Ferguson and Dylan McKeigh lining up in the centre midfield. And I have gone for Johnny Hayes to, to go into that left wing position. Obviously, we've got the option of Austin Samuels, who's found himself very much out of favour in, in recent weeks for one reason or another, but maybe an option to come on off the bench if you know we're getting tired or Celtic are getting tired after their European exploits and maybe something mm-hmm. we can exploit on our back line. And then Watkins playing behind Ramirez, as you mentioned earlier, is how I think we will line up. A kind of 4 4 one, one. Glenn, you know I listen to you yeah. all the time. Uh, I listen to you on the state of Scottish football. I listen to these. I cannot believe you've not picked Matty Long stuff. Well, because I haven't listened well enough then, because you know, <laughs> you know how uh, you know my uh, feelings that I made clear last night on the state of Scottish football. But if he, well, I'll say it on here as well. If case folk weren't listening, if he scores the winner on Sunday, I will eat my hat live. <laughs> And well, actually, that's actually very fitting you bring that up because, Colin, you are joining us again on Monday evening before your five-a-side football. It will be Red Tinted Glass's 98th episode. And to mark the week before the 100th episode, we are doing two live shows because we have such a busy schedule. So Colin will be joining myself and Callum live on Red Tinted Glass's YouTube channel at 7 o'clock on Monday evening to, to go over what is... This is potentially going to be a disastrous Sunday but hopefully something positive for us to speak about from an Aberdeen point of view and then um, myself and Calm will look ahead to the midweek clash with Livingston and as we mentioned earlier in the show this will be when the raffle for the charity prizes that we are auctioning off and uh, we've got two tickets to the Boxing Day clash between Aberdeen and Dundee a signed pair of boots from Richie Byrne and a, a print that is is similar, well, it's by the same guy from that's behind me there, Matthew J. Wood. It is a Subutio 11 of the 1983 European Cup winning cup team. So it will be £10 per entry and we will then make the draw a week on, uh, f- the following week on Monday with all money being split between the Aberdeen Community Trust and local charity Aberdeen Necessities who, as we mentioned earlier, do such a great job for children and families that currently live below the poverty line and we're just wanting to give something back to the community and, and those children and families that need a bit of extra cheer at this time of year. You know, what better way to, to thank everyone for your continued support with our show than, than give something back to everyone 
So Colin, I just want to finish off by saying thank you very much for joining us once again on Red Tinted Glasses and we'll catch up again on Monday. Take care, Glenn. And uh, this will finally clear up that me and Callum have no beef. We will be live next Monday <laughs> and hopefully he'll be disappointed. <laughs> well, expect fireworks then. Thank you very much. <laughs>